Welcome to Money Congruous, where we discuss personal finance and investment tips. We are committed to helping people create wealth and achieve financial freedom. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Alright then, let's head into today's conversation. Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to Money Convos. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to us every week. We really do appreciate your continued support and engagement. Um, do remember to like, subscribe and share this with friends, family and loved ones. And let's keep educating ourselves on money and aim for financially independent lives or in Ramit's words, our rich lives. And speaking of Ramit today, we are going to continue our discussion on this wonderful TV show, How to Get Rich. We have already discussed episodes one to six and learned some brilliant lessons from them. And we cannot wait to get into today's episode, which is episode seven, titled Bills and Wedding Bells. Um, so before we head into the conversation, let's check up on our bishop. Hi, Adam, how are you doing? Hello. <laughs> Dennis, I'm doing good. Yourself? I'm also well. I'm also well. Hope you had a nice day. Oh, yes. yes, yes. It was a bit tiring, but it's, it's fine. That's wonderful. So then let's let's get into the conversation and then get it started. Yeah. yeah so um, speaking of bills and weddings, it's, it's interesting to see how Ramit assists the couple in having an honest conversation about their credit card debts. And he also helps another couple who are also planning on navigating their wedding budget. And this episode also features a host of other clients that Ramit is working with. And we'll get right into all of those in a minute. But Adam, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, the importance of open communication on personal finances with our partners or soon-to-be partners. How did you see that play out in the case of Drew and Mikey with the credit card debt issue. What, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, the 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 essence of communication was um, was more like it was pushed forth more strongly in this episode. That um, for example, in uh, you know Drew was always afraid, and he, he seemed to have that fear that if he comes open about the situation of his credit card debt, then it meant that he was going to uh, um, probably make Mike um, get up free and not go ahead with the marriage or something like that. So that fear was there. But with Mar- Ramit helping them to go through and walk through this kind of conversation, I think it was a good, it was a good thing because um, it is sort of like opened up uh, the communication channel. It helped them to start to see from different perspectives, you know, where, um, you know, Drew was feeling like he's not doing enough. He's not earning enough. He's the one racking up the debt. And Mike is the one who is bringing in all the money and seems to like be spending it on him. So he didn't have that. He didn't like that kind of situation. But I think it was good they had that communication because um, it's, it sort of set them up for the right um on the right note because these things they they come back later and hunt the uh, the relationship or the marriage because if you don't open up and have these honest and then hard discussions in the beginning later on um these things will pop up and then bring a lot of problems so i think it it, it for me I like that idea that they were able to have that conversation, even though it was a bit difficult. But in the end, you saw that they were able to make compromises here and there. Yeah. I think you you mentioned some very excellent points about bringing it up earlier so that it doesn't haunt you in the future. Because I remember Mikey made a statement about it being just credit card debts and not being a $45,000 debt that he had. And that made me realize, hmm, our partners can be understanding to a point and we should not test their patience. If this credit card debt had gone on and accumulated in latter stages, that would have probably been the end of Drew's marriage. So I think you made some excellent points about discussing some of these issues earlier so that you take the pain earlier and not risk losing your marriage or your partner in the future. 
Thank you very much, Eden. Um, on the other side, we also see another co- another couple um, who are also budgeting for their for their wedding. And I have to ask this, Eden, do you think fifty four guests for a wedding in Ghana is, is it is it realistic? Because in the case of Reggie, he budgeted for a total of fifty four people, nothing more. Do you think that's realistic in Ghana? <laughs> I, I I I don't think it's very realistic. <laughs> The, our whole setup and the way it is, you know, our families. I mean, if I should even start counting from my family side, like I mean, people who are family, family or not, just, <laughs> I'm sure I would already hit 54. Uh-huh. So uh, it was it was an interesting thing to see him trying because you can see he is very particular about numbers and the budget. He is trying not to exceed the budget. So that's why he's looking at seeing, and he also mentioned the fact that he's from a very family oriented background. The, you know, Philippines, the Filipinos too are also a very family oriented people. So when it comes to weddings, they, they really have all this, but it looks like the 54 was more like, I don't know whether I got it right, whether it was more of from his side or I don't know whether it was for both him and Sarah. I don't quite remember what I got out of that, but I mean, in our context, 54 will be a hard, stretch if it's from one side possibly yeah but um unless of course it is not your typical wedding wedding like we understand it like a white wedding maybe if it is just a a traditional marriage at home where a few people within the family or key people who are um necessary for the event to happen that's possible yeah you can have that small number but if you're thinking about more like a white wedding well it's also possible but you know it comes with all these family dynamics and normally people just want to <laughs> but it's it's in it, i can't say it is not possible i just i just will say that it is a matter of the kind of dynamics you would face and the pushback and the, and the, the way people would take it and how you you would you will handle the after effects and all that but i mean it's a stretch but it's possible it all depends on your goals and what you hope to achieve and what you want to do and you could actually just walk to a uh, registrar general uh, ame or something also go and do that it's equally a wedding so <laughs> yeah yeah i get you i think the cultural aspect that you mentioned also play a key role because in the previous episode i think they did mention that the wedding will mean a lot to them it actually means the world to them to have a really beautiful wedding so um i mean it would, it would make sense that they want just the the close family and immediate friends to be there and another key theme that we see is the issue of the budgets so if you would remember in the case of um, Sarah buying her wedding dress. She budgeted four thousand dollars for two dresses, one for the wedding itself and one for the reception. But here's the case where she has to go for um, a wedding dress which is slightly above the budget, and this is just one, so that will cost her around six thousand five hundred dollars if I remember correctly. And that is just one. In the case where you have to have a difficult conversation on budgets like this with your partner how do you think you should go about them yeah first first of all do you think you should go about them having such difficult um, conversations with your partner i i i I could see the hesitance in um (laughs) in reggie when he he got to that point when he had the 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 figure thrown at him because hey he knows that the budget was four thousand for two dresses now you are coming with one dress alone which is just 6,000 something. And you are saying, that okay, now instead of doing two dresses, I'll just do one dress, but it's still over the budget. So the challenge is that I saw how he tried not to sound very, because he has been accused already, you know, Ramit said it in the beginning, and that was our beef with him on the last episode. It was more like, he seemed to be going after him for his detailedness. Okay, but these are tough decisions uh, or tough conversations that must be had anyway. And I like that he didn't just push it in front of her at that time because it might have degenerated into a, a kind of heated argument. Probably most of the time, yes, he has heard it. He can give some time to process it. 
when his emotions are less um, up there, then you have that discussion. And I think it's also the way and manner you you bring it because you can see, like you're saying, this is a wedding that means a lot to both of them. But then we also have to think about the fact that there is also a budget to be to be uh, wed with, so that you don't end up in in debt or in a worse off place than before the wedding. So that discussion would definitely have to be had. But how do you have it? You have to approach it with tact and also approach it with um with some empathy. Okay, where normally people uh, like what we learn about giving negative when you are trying to give some kind of um, feedback which you know uh, uh, is maybe the person is in the wrong and you are trying to bring you give the you use the sandwich approach where you start with a, a positive thing then you dish out the main negative then you you end it up with another positive so you use that sandwich approach to be able to deliver the the medicine you want to deliver so in this case where it's a tough thing. It's like she's all excited about this dress, but he could have to be tactful, tactful about it and know how he can approach her and let her know that, look, this is our budget. We both agreed we want to stick to this budget. Yes, this is very beautiful. This is what you want, but um, we would have to stick with it. Looking at all the other dreams and aspirations that we have planned and lined up, if we go this way, and this way and this way, before we realize, we'll derail all our dreams and aspirations that we have lined up. So it is important that we start to take some of these hard decisions now. And I think any reasonable person will be able to come around. I know it's not an easy thing for especially people who are looking at having this glamorous and very wonderful wedding. It's still a tough decision and it's still a, a tough conversation that must be held anyway. Those are some very good points. and. As you were speaking, I was just imagining, okay, so this is Sarah's point of view, going to Reggie with um, a budget request to increase the, the allocation for the dress. But in terms of Reggie, what will be going through his mind? On one hand, the wedding means a lot to him. He wants to give um, Sarah the wedding of her dreams. But on the other hand, he's, he's a, what do you call, a stick for rules, you know, very detailed, very particular. And he has budgeted for 54 people, probably budgeted the 4K, $4,000, sorry, already for the dress. So would if I don't cough out the extra money for the dress, would Sarah say, I don't love her enough to give her the wedding of her dreams? Do I risk going over the budget? If for a dress, for this little dress, we are going over budget, what about the other things? What if she changes the venue? Does this set a, a good precedent for the other expenses as well? But what do you think would be going through Reggie's mind? In, in, or you could say this in your context. I mean, if you are approached by your partner or soon-to-be partner with this sort of issue, what are some of the things you'll be thinking about? What, what will be your thoughts on? I don't know if um, Sarah was looking at his face very well and very attentively, but he could have, I'm sure she would have gotten all the signals <laughs> because it was so obvious on his face how he was feeling. And for me, what I'll be feeling would be, and the first thing that will come to my mind, oh, what's going on with you? Like, because we've discussed this, we've talked about it, you know, and all of that because like you were saying, the same thing will be running through my head yeah, because this is the first budget um how do they call it? Increase request. What signal will you be sending if, or will I be sending if I grant this one? Like you're saying, next thing will come. Oh, the venue, we need to do this and that and that. Next thing, oh, maybe this decor, we need to increase this place. Next thing, something else and something else and something. Before you know it, you are hundred percent over budget. And it's so easy to get, to go over budget. It's so, so easy. Okay, it's so, so easy to go over budget. So these are some of the questions that will be running through my mind. And more importantly, like you were saying, one of the things that will be even running through my mind is how do you best this bubble and not hurt the other person's feelings? Because these are sensitive times where emotions are all over the place. And if you are not careful, it might degenerate into something else. Because I know, I know a lot of pe- couples have a lot of quarrels during wedding preparations period because of things like this. Because next thing, you are disagreeing as to how to approach it. If the, the thing is that bottom line, the two of you want to be married and you want to have a beautiful wedding. The problem is the how. 
And that's where the differences always come up. And then you see that one person wants to go this way, the other person wants to go in this direction. And if you are not able to communicate well and nicely and with empathetically, that's what I keep saying because you have to also think about the other person and the person's feelings and where they are coming from. See things from their perspectives also. Even though we have a plan, we have to keep thinking about it because life also has to be flexible to be able to adapt and then include certain things. But then having the ultimate goal in mind so that we don't derail and go off. And then in the end, we are, we get our fingers bitten and we are, we are worse off than we started. So those are the things that will be running through my mind. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned some very excellent points. And I think for me, one thing they could have done to avoid all this is, I mean, you've, you've never had a wedding before. So ask around. There are definitely friends or people you know that have married. Ask them for approximate cost of some of these things. Because for me, budgeting the 4000 for two and getting surprised at the shop, that the least one they could get was around 6000 signal that they, they didn't ask around. They didn't do enough research. So it's good to ask around, do enough research about some of these things before taking those decisions. And it really helps. Makes the budgeting easier. Makes the difficult conversations also very easy. And so, I mean, weddings are a very controversial uh, topic when they go wrong. But I think with all these strategies we are learning from the series, we could have very beautiful events and then make them memorable as well. Um, let's flip to the other side, to Frank, our entertainment prefect. And so Frank, in the last episode, said he's quitting his full-time job. He, 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 he wants to stop working. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he has some $75,000 coming in. So, I mean, he can sustain on that for a while while building some small side hustle. I mean, what are your thoughts on Frank's story so far? Adam, how, how do you think of, what, what do you think of his story and then the decision he's taking? Yeah, I think that Frank is an interesting character. Um, he's lively and uh, he's uh, an on-the-go person. And uh, well, like, so I think that he doesn't like to, he's, I think he comes off as on the spur of the moment person. The thing just comes into his mind and he's just running with it doesn't really give things that much of a deep thought. But I like the fact that um, Ramit started to sit him down and even go through the budget process. And as he started to budget, he realized that even his uh, his um, his planned expenses against his uh, income was about $1,000 over. And that was already beginning to show signs that, hey, this is what is the cause of him borrowing. Even though he brings in quite good money, you see that because he's not, he's not really sat down to be planning his expenses and all that. He has ended up racking up debt. And so these are some of the, the interesting thing. And even the idea of quitting his job and starting the side hustle. He, he hadn't thought through it very clearly. He hadn't thought through it very thoroughly. He just knows that, oh, he's going to do this thing. And you see the big money that was coming. You realize from the conversation with Ramit, Ramit said something about the fact that, you know, this is not even the first big money he has received. And before he knew it, the other times, he didn't know where the money went. And so it's, it was a good thing Ramit took him through the process so that especially to get him in order before the next $75,000 comes in and he will end up blowing it. So it was a good thing the way it happened. Yeah. Very interesting. And Frank also mentioned something. I think there was a statement he made that he makes more money now than he has ever had, but he's still doing the same things he's, he was doing as a teenager with money. And in earlier episodes, he tells us a story about money, how he was unappreciated at the beginning of his life. So money, sort of spending money became his comfort zone. But it fits into the conversation about emotional spending that we had last week. I mean, excitement that comes with coming into a windfall of money can overwhelm you. Sometimes you come into money that you've never seen before and that pushes you to spend because literally you don't have anything to do with it. What are your thoughts on that, Adam, and taking insight from last week's conversation? Yeah, it, it, I think it's, 
a real danger when you have not planned and you receive some windfall money. It's a big, big, big uh, 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 danger. Where if you are not careful, you might be worse off than even if you hadn't received that money. Because you might end up going on the uh, uh, spending spree or you'll be splurging. And like we said, emotional spending, you'll be moved because all of a sudden, I don't know if it has happened to you before or it's uh, other people who will be listening, who are listening on the call, whether it's ever happened to them, that you know that the moment money enters your hands, you remember all the things that you have to do. There you then remember that you wanted to buy this shoe, you wanted to buy this, you wanted to buy this, you wanted to buy this, and then all of a sudden, you use that same money to plan for this one, for this one, for this one. And the next thing you know, all your money is gone. So um, looking at how Frank was going about, um, he has always been receiving huge amounts of money here and there. And generally, even other monies he he gets, he gets from some other businesses and uh, side hustles and stuff. Um, but his challenge has always been not having a plan and not being intentional about his spending and his money. So it is the reason why even though those monies come in, he still finds himself in a situation whereby he has to rely on credit cards to be able to make it to the end of the month or to be able to make certain purchases. You see, so um it tells us that if we don't put ourselves in order, plan properly, have a budget, anticipate uh, and, and, and or be intentional, and stick to our plans, okay? We can receive this big, big money. And the next thing we will know, that we don't know where the money has passed. And then we'll be asking ourselves that, ah, was I not the same person who just had some 20,000 or some 10,000 or some 5,000 or some 15,000 or whichever kind of money that you were not expecting coming into your hands? Uh huh. So it's the same uh, 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 um, thing. And I, I, I think, a lot of lessons from that because it happens, it's happened to me a, a number of times. Okay. I mean, even though I, I am somebody who is intentional, I plan and everything. Sometimes you are caught off guard. You know, you receive some monies that you least expected. And then oh, before you turn around, you don't know where the money has passed. And when you sit down and start listing all the things you have bought, you would realize that to the last CD, it adds up to the money that you receive. And you'll be surprised that, hey, all this money just passed through my hands. That's how money is. And so if you are not intentional and you don't plan for it, it will just come and slip through your fingers and it will go. And that has been Frank's problem all this while. But it was nice to see that in this episode, he has started putting himself together and uh, 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 trying to work towards building a, a good habit. Yeah. Yeah, I think... In, the, in this episode, we see Frank making progress, so some good points on that one for me as well. Well, let's let's switch the conversation to Christian. I mean, Christian, Christian mentioned something very interesting. So while uh, people have big financial goals for themselves to build houses, uh, buy cars, you know, go on expensive vacations and all of that, Christian says his main goal is to retire his mother. It really got me thinking, I mean, am I selfish if all my major financial goals are about myself and not about my family? Because looking at Christian, he has built quite a life for himself and then the wife. But he says, above all else, he wants to retire his mother. So, Adam, looking at our how we depend on our families here in Africa, especially Ghana, how we depend on our families and the extended family to survive and then go to school and all of that. If I'm making my big financial goals and then I don't include them, would you count that as selfish? <laughs> well, I I don't know. I don't know whether I would say it's selfish, but this is how I approach the the, the answer. I would say that um in our context, like you said, family is plays a very major role. You know, a lot of people weigh it whereas in the culture that we are this um, series is is placed in you find out that young people rise from about 18, 19, 20, they are moving out and starting their own lives and doing what have you, living, starting to work towards their dreams and all that. You realize in our part of the world, that is a bit muted and delayed because of circumstances. So you see that we rely on our families quite a lot. And even through university, 
Whereas you, you've been listening to Dave Ramsey's show where people call in young people in their twenties and then they already have so much college debts, you know, student loans and what have you, because they have to pick up those um, responsibilities on their own to fund their college education and what have you. You find that over here, quite a number of people are taken care of by their parents or some extended family or something like that, or member of a community or what have you. Yes, we have a number of people who still have to rely on student loans and other kinds of supports, but you, you find that uh, quite a lot of people are supported by their parents or their uh, uh, immediate family or extended family or what have you. So given that backdrop, and I see that that is the same thing uh, Christian found himself in, that you then have that kind of thing at your back, at the back of your mind that you would want to reciprocate that kind of, um, uh, what do they call it, help that has been given to you. So you must situate it within the context of the, 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 the conversation we had in the past about black tax. Okay. Where there's a fine balance. Okay. Where you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you end up drowning and you cannot assist the people who are drowning to be rescued. Okay. Or like in the case of an airplane that is having, that has already lost, uh, that has just suddenly lost pressure or it's on the way to, 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 to just falling or crashing where they say, the, the, the nose marks have, or the marks have been, oxygen marks have been released. You are told to put it on your nose first before you assist the child because it is when you are able to survive that you will be able to help the other person. So this comes back to this conversation all the time that yes, you need to include your family and what have you in whatever you are doing. But then you must also have that thing, that firm uh, or fine line that you have to thread, which is a balance to ensure that you don't put yourself in a situation where you kill yourself and then you, you are the breadwinner of the family. Now you are lost. The, everybody is now lost, lost. Uh-huh. So uh, I would not, uh, I know in other cultures, I mean, you don't have to think about it. It is you and you and you. But then in our context, you, we, we feel like family is also important. So you must make some kind of provision for them. Within your means, obviously, you shouldn't go beyond to put yourself in a situation where you set yourself up for failure. But something that is reasonable, okay, that can also assist and help. It's, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's only nice and fair. Even in a situation where they might not necessarily need a kind of support, maybe every once in a while, something as a gift or a thank you. I mean, something just to put a smile on their face is fine. But where, for example, in, in, in Christian's case, where you see that, um, his mom, I believe was a, was an immigrant that came in and had worked hard, didn't know so much, but some way somehow put him through school and what have you. And then, but she's at a point where she still has to keep working because, um, she needs the income to keep going. And that's where we find a number of people to find their parents because maybe they didn't know so much, so they couldn't prepare for retirement well. So it will not be a bad idea if you have them in your mind and you have them in your plans and give some kinds of sustenance to just assist them to go along as you are, as they are aging and as they are growing. Yeah. Very good words, Adam. I think your points on the family issue and the black tax were, were spot on. And I don't know how this will play out in the subsequent episode, which is the last episode. That, but it will be interesting to see how Christian navigates the advice Ramita is given to him about his family. And there was also the issue of the draft kids, the, the investment he made, which, which went down about is $80,000. He, he lost about $80,000 on that, on that bet. But you could see that he, one way, he was unwilling to let go of that because he had sort of a betting addiction. The investment is now at 20000 I mean, you could still uh, redeem that 20000 and do something meaningful with it. Some way, somehow, Christian is still resisting the thoughts and we to also push him on that. Um, in the case where we are supposed to help someone, 
with a, a betting addiction. Have you ever helped someone with that addiction before? Uh, or that kind of, uh, I mean, attraction to betting before? And how would you say we should go about it? Um, I have not helped anybody in that situation before, even though I know one or two, because, you know, addictions are such that if people are, they don't come to you to request or to tell you that they want help, it's quite a difficult or it's like kind of like a, a how do I call it, a fishing expedition. You you will just be moving and moving with it because addictions are quite difficult. And even where people are willing to stop or to, 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 to where they are willing and they, they see the negatives about what kind of addiction it is and they want out. It's never easy. You see, so where the person hasn't even gotten to the point where he says that, oh, I'm willing. I want to stop this thing. I want assistance. I want help. Uh, it's quite difficult. You know, so as for, so that is why you see, for example, at this point where it is being shown, he hasn't yet accepted that it's a problem. Okay. So when he accepts it's a problem, that's step one. Then step two, when he now requests for help, then we know that we are making progress and then we can start moving on one on one and then going through processes, which will include ups and downs because addictions uh, were not formed overnight and they will not be broken overnight either. Yeah. Very good point. I think you, you mentioned something about them not opening up. So I think Christian has yet to realize that it's a problem for him. I think even when they met, they, he mentioned it in front of the wife, he's still positive that, you know, we've lost this match, but it can still go up and then we'll make something more. So until he, he admits that it's a problem, um, it's, it will be interesting to see how Ramit helps him get out of that problem. And now switching the conversation to something more career related, we see getting to the end that one of the goals of Drew was to help find a job, find a job, um, a well-paying one, because currently he sort of waits part-time, dance, dances part-time to support his husband. So he wants to find a job. And Ramit said something about finding a job. He said the average job candidate sends a resume through a random website and waits for a response. But then the best jobs are found through a network. W what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, this I think this thing holds true in so many places. Um, I think when I was doing my MBA, the, I think in our HR class, that's one of the things our HR lecturer was mentioning when he we talked about uh, uh, recruitment and uh, training or something like that. When we're talking about recruitment, basically, um, mentioned the fact that I think there is a research that says about how many percent of jobs are not advertised and most of them are either internally uh, maybe internal recruitment or referrals or uh, uh, maybe direct um, where people directly go and engage or they poach other people and bring them so it's it's actually true that networks really help in getting jobs it's very 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 true because there are so many opportunities that are out there that don't get publicized in the first place. Uh -huh. So there is somebody who is just, um, uh, like even the way I work at the moment, I, it was not even advertised. It was my, I was just there, my friend called, hey, uh, 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 my boss is in need of this, this type of person. Are you interested? I said, oh yes, I'm interested. Then I go there, we have the conversation. It was just, it wasn't even an interview to, 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 to start with or season. He just wanted to, in, engage the person because this person has re a, a, a recommended this person to him. Oh, so he trusts this guy's judgment. And then that has been it. And just like that, I got the job. You know, so there are some uh, opportunities that won't get published anywhere. And and there are some that will also be a, a, a referral, some that will also be a, a, maybe even you asking people and then they telling you that, oh, maybe someone is about to leave a particular position. It looks like you'll be a good fit. And then 
it starts from there. So these opportunities are out there. So when you are, you go your network to, you, you, you get exposed to places and opportunities that you would otherwise not be able to get uh, uh, into. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting the way you, you narrate your story as well. And I think because I recently got out of school, a lot of conversations in our year group chats are mostly about this, this issue, about not having the right network uh, to find jobs, Ghana being hard. For the issues about not having a network, I mean, it's, it's, it's very tricky because if you don't get to know somebody, they won't know you in the first place. So the advice I'm always giving to my close friends when we are having these kind of these kind of conversations are look, try to know somebody. Maybe not everybody will respond to you. And, and now it's even easy. You can use LinkedIn. I mean people cold message people all the time. If it doesn't at least, even if you message twenty people, someone will respond. And Ramit also gives a very good tip in the video in the um, the movie. He calls it an informational interview. By his narration, he says it's not really a job interview, but where you go asking for career advice. So sort of you identify people in your in your career path where or people in positions where you want to get to and then reach out to them and then ask for career advice. And most of the time, some of these career advices turn into meaningful connections for you because you never know where opportunities may come from your opportunity to upscale or get a better job might come from one conversation, one conversation you never expected. So try to be intentional and reach out to people when it comes to finding opportunities and jobs. And it may be tiring, it, it may be discomforting at the beginning, but it always pays off at the end and then you get rewarded. So on the issue of the career, I think um, it will be interesting to see if Drew um, um, takes Ramit's advice and then um, implements them as well. So I think we've pretty much covered every single character in the in the episode, and our next episode will be episode eight, and it will be very interesting to see how things play out in the final episode of the season. And so, Adam, wrapping up, what would be your final words? Um, combining all the insights we've, we've learned from all the different characters with brilliant stories and what will be your, your last words for our audience? So like um, I think most of the time from all the, the, the episodes when we began up to now, one theme keeps running. You cannot be unintentional about your money. You must be intentional about it. And being intentional means planning is involved. Being intentional means you are, you are, you are trying to stick to a budget. Being intentional means you are going out of your way to make changes and, and, and point out things that are wrong in your life. And for example, where we just, what we just wrapped up on in terms of, um, career or getting a job and what have you. I mean, for, for younger people who are now joining, who are listening to us, one of the things I would say is that you must ensure that uh, you try to grow your network. There are older people, maybe if you belong to a church, it's even a good place to start. Okay, go make sure that you interact with those who are older than you. Like the informational interview that uh, Rami talked about. It's, it's something you can actually do on a daily basis in any place. Just talk to random people. There are some young people in my church who approach me, those who are in building or uh, civil engineering or building construction or something related, they, they come closer and then they ask questions. And I give, I, I, at least I try to answer them and I, I try to give them the best of advice I can. Okay. And from that, it will place you, uh, give you an edge over the average um, person who is graduating or completing school. And if you've just finished too and you have, you are, you are maybe doing national service. It's a good place to, 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 to extend yourself, you know, go beyond your, the, the regular task that you are doing. Be interested in knowing how the organization works. 
you know, there are all these things that people say, yes, they are being sent to go and do photocopy or buy this and all that. Be interested in doing more, like finding out more and getting, I know there are some people who can be snobbish, but in every organization, you can scan the environment and see the, pe- the kinds of people who are open and willing to help. So you can scan the environment and see where you can put uh, uh, and, 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 and align yourself and make sure that you can benefit out of the, the situation. So all this is about being intentional. Okay. And so intentional in the workplace, intentional with your monies, intentional with how you're spending, intentional with how you communicate and all of that. And it will sum up in the end and be a benefit to you. Yeah. You cannot be unintentional about your money and be intentional about your network. Thank you very much, Adam, for the words so sweet and the wise words. And thank you so much to you, our audience, for tuning in tonight for this amazing session. We will cover episode eight very soon, so stay tuned. And whilst you are here listening to this wonderful episode, also visit Investment Friend on Instagram whenever you get there, investment underscore friend. Whenever you want tailored financial advice to help you um, make better financial decisions, that's also another platform you can get to. There we run um, savings challenges, investment challenges that you can get involved in to make to improve your financial situation as well. And next week we'll bring you another very interesting conversation. So stay tuned. Make sure to like, subscribe, and. Um, share our post to family, friends, and loved ones as well. That's all benefits from learning more about money. And remember to prioritize your own finances before you help others. Because as Adam said, you cannot help anybody if you run out of money. So let's keep learning, let's keep growing, and let's keep aiming for financial independence. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our thoughts. I hope you learned a thing or two and start practicing. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Do tell a friend about Money Convos so we all become wealthy together. Talk to you soon. Bye.